Oggi è una brutta giornata qui in microfono. <ride> Buonasera, benvenuti a uno degli incontri attesi di Incroci di Civiltà, l'incontro con l'editoria, l'incontro con la premiata, del, con il premio Cesare De Michelis, chi era l'inaugurazione ha potuto assistere alla premiazione, ma l'incontro di oggi è la parte significativa, e cioè il momento in cui la premiata, Fiona McCry, discuterà con eh, i suoi discussants la sua attività e il senso dell'editoria. È una tavola rotonda, l'abbiamo chiamata una vita per i libri, perché la sua è stata una vita per i libri, le sfide dell'editoria oggi. Fiona McRae converserà con Teresa Cremisi, editrice e presidente della giuria del premio Cesare De Michelis e con i precedenti vincitori del premio De Michelis, Navin Fisciore, vincitore del primo, della prima edizione, e Michel Kruger, vincitore dell'edizione dell'anno scorso. Questo è un evento che eh, esiste grazie a una collaborazione, che è una collaborazione che sta andando avanti da tre anni, ma che ha avuto come dire, una, un momento preparativo molto importante in precedenza, una collaborazione tra Marsiglio Editori, di cui voglio ringraziare moltissimo Emanuela Bassetti che è qui con noi, e Luca De Michelis per aver lanciato l'iniziativa, averla proposta a incroci di civiltà all'Università Ca' Foscari, Università Ca' Foscari e la Fondazione di Venezia. Ecco, questo è un incontro che si svolgerà in lingua inglese, per coloro che volessero, c'è la traduzione, quindi chi non ha preso ancora le cuffie di eh, affretti. E, without further ado, come si dice, come dicono i britannici, vorrei chiamare sul palcoscenico, I'd like to call on stage, Fiona McRae. <applausi> Navin Kishore. Michael Kruger, e la moderatrice del dibattito, Teresa Cremisi. Buona conversazione. Nell'ambito di questo premio dedicato a Cesare De Michelis sull'editore, il mestiere di editore e il premio all'editore dell'anno, abbiamo instaurato ormai questo appuntamento, cioè parlare con il premiato, in questo momento siamo molto fortunati, abbiamo tre premiati, di che cos'è essere editore. Che strano mestiere è, è un mestiere in fondo abbastanza recente, fino alla fine del Settecento c'erano dei librai ma non, non c'era l'editore come è oggi. È un mestiere che fa da tramite tra il lettore, lo spirito del tempo e produce un libro oggetto di cultura e oggetto di commercio. Abbiamo scelto di scegliere degli editori internazionali estremamente eh, noti per la costanza, per il tempo che hanno dedicato a questo mestiere e le tre persone che avete sul palco sono degli esempi mirabili di come si possa svolgere questo mestiere con un'altissima ambizione ma anche molta attenzione ai costi, perché è anche un commercio. Il mestiere è un po' strabico, un occhio al commercio e un occhio allo spirito del tempo e allo spirito tout court, cioè all'intelletto. 
Adesso eh, lanceremo, credo, una video, poi parlerà eh, Fiona Macrae, interrogata da me stessa e con testimonianze di Michel Kruger e di Navin Kishore. Naturalmente dopo forse ci sarà un piccolo spazio per qualche domanda. Spero che dopo questa conversazione avrete un'idea più chiara di quello che è il nostro mestiere. Grazie. We should be around 33 books a year. 23 of those slots are taken by returning Grey Wolf writers, and then there's six or seven new writers. We're not trying to bring the value to the books. We're trying to follow the authors. It's not prescribed what a Grey Wolf book could be. The thing that we're looking at to measure success is what kinds of conversations are these books driving? Grey Wolf is invested in a literary landscape that is actually reflective of the American landscape. We're seeing higher sales over the last few years than we'd seen previously, but um, it didn't come out of nowhere. I would say there were years when we were planting seeds, and now we're harvesting some of those early initiatives. The Nobel Prize, the Pulitzer Prize, the Booker Prize, the National Book Awards, represented on every single one, on every single list. Grey Wolf has been an extraordinary force for good when it comes to pushing the boundaries of what we're reading. At the end of the year, when we report to our stakeholders, our board and our national council, they're looking at the value that we've added to the culture. Publishing is never a one-person job anyway. It's already the writer and the editor and then the whole team. We're so grateful and conscious to the booksellers, to the reviewers, all the people who open their doors to Grey Wolf, and a particular place in our hearts for the people who've shared the contents of their wallets with us. They're our family, and they help us make Grey Wolf what it is. Who would have ever thought that this independent press from Minneapolis was going to become a powerhouse by simply staying true to its mission? Fiona, it's the moment to explain to everybody here what was your story, why did you become a publisher, and to s talk with you, with us, with our experience. So, my life story. <laughs> Are you sitting comfortably? Um, well, thank you so much um, for having me and uh, again to the jury for selecting myself and Grey Wolf and um, thanks to everyone at Marsilio and Francesca for all the work that she's done. Let me ask a quick question. I see a youngish crowd over there. I'm wondering, um, how, oh, and over there, how many people here are interested to maybe one day work in publishing? <laughs> lovely, <laughs> lovely, that's Half great. <laughs> so I had that idea too, and, um, but I dismissed it actually. I thought, nah, I, I'll never get in, and I actually was going to become a teacher. And uh, much to my mother's disappointment, she thought I could be more, should be more ambitious, but I thought that, I still think teaching's interesting. And... Um, on the way to, spe to um, earn some money before going into teaching and to get some life experience, I fell into publishing. And um, I, after a few months, I left the job I started in, and I ended up in the editorial department of Faber and Faber in London, and um, just got, got absorbed in it. And um, I would say that for the first couple of years, a lot of my work was um, went in at the junior level. So I was typing, and mostly typing for men. 
and there was a sort of room of us younger women assistants running, look, looking after the sort of big, big shot male editors. But there were openings and um, I learned a lot at Faber and Faber because it's a very literary house in London and it had writers from the past that were clearly selling in the present. Some of those were poets, some of those are novelists. And then there was a younger editorial director who was taking on the writers for the present. And I sort of got promoted and um, I ended up working in America for Faber's smaller office out there. They wanted somebody to grow the American office. And when I was in America, I found that the, am I speaking too fast? I'll slow down a bit. I'm, I've, it's okay? I'm, I'm, I discovered that um, there was a very vibrant scene, if you like, um, field of small presses. They were more robust in the States than they were in England because in America is so vast and the larger houses would not take on a book, perhaps, arguably, if they thought they couldn't sell more than 15,000 copies, more than 40,000 copies. And that left a lot of really interesting books going unpublished. And I started to take some of those on at Faber in America. And um, then I heard about the, the fact that there were nonprofit publishers. There were some, I was in the Boston area where there are universities and there were literary magazines, which is also very healthy in America. I was saying the other day that the Americans feel that everywhere else, Italy, France, wherever, Germany, India, is much more cultured than they are. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't value, in a way, the, the way that they look after the short story that's published in so many magazines and the way that they um, support all these presses um, and magazines. So um, I had, when I was in London, I had appreciated the work of Grey Wolf Press, and um, I decided that I could maybe make more of a difference there. And I, there was a job going to run it with a director. And at that time, I, I chose that rather than going back underneath somebody else in a larger company. And I was also interested to work for a place that was coming to the rescue, that was moving into that gap where books were being not taken on because they were too challenging, they were in translation or the genre wasn't popular, rather than fighting with six other editors for the same book. And some of you might really enjoy that, some people do enjoy that, but it, that never particularly interested me. So, um, so I joined Grey Wolf. So that takes us to me joining Grey Wolf. So I'll stop there and anybody else wants to chime in or if you've got a follow-up question. Tell everybody what meant to begin with Faber when, for a young woman, Faber with his story of the enormous background of cultural stories was, was so exciting for you, the beginning? It was very exciting, yeah. And when you left, it was painful? Well, I left, um, I left the American office, yes. not the London, I mean, yes. obviously I left the London office yes, but of first, course. and um, Grey Wolf seemed to have that spirit that continued, yes. yeah. um, but when I worked at Faber, at one time I worked for the man who had discovered William Golding and Ted Hughes, and um, he was writing he was dictating letters that I was typing to Samuel Beckett. And I wanted to put at the bottom, I typed <laughs> to Samuel Beckett, but I didn't, of course. Um, but he was a certain kind of guy also. And there was uh, yeah, a silly story, but one time there was a woman um, who, who worked for him after I'd stopped working for him. And she was sitting there, and the, this man was sitting here, and there were the only two chairs and the male poetry editor came in, whose name was Craig, and the editor said, Craig, have a chair. <laughs> and the, the assistant was sitting in it. 
you know. So he was wonderful and had lots of stories. But there was also, uh, one of the things that I like about publishing is anything you say about it, the opposite is also true. So there were a lot of men there at that time. But there were also, there was a one director who was a woman and she hired a lot of us. Um, it's interesting to see her. Some of the men were quite young and they had been promoted young and they were interested in the young people. So they promoted some of us. So I've, I find publishing is always closing and always opening. There's always, um, you know, one huge company is buying another huge company, but then there are small companies opening. So it's a movement, and then you, you sort of choose where you want to be, and you, you find your path through. But there were ridiculous things, like, um, yeah, anyway, I've, I've given you some ridiculous examples. But and then, and then also, now in the States, um, we've, we've realized that for many years, publishing was, we, we started to include women, but we had not been so good at including people from outside the majority culture, people who were not white, people who had different experiences, even living in America. So that's, that's another thing that's changing. Um, so that's, that's a, a good, another good tension where people have found ways in. And it's, so I, I would say there's been an, an arc of opening throughout my time at publishing, even despite those closed doors that you also find, or, Shut minds, shut minds and shut doors. But. Would you say that uh, now in America, the independents or the smaller publishers uh, are uh, having a special role, a special position in, in, the, in, the, in the American publishing? Is it a necessary? Uh, position uh, because the bigger houses are not uh, looking after the young people or the black or the whatever yeah. they come from. Um, and uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about this uh, strange mixture uh, because uh, coming from Faber and Faber, you did not mention that Faber and Faber is one of the big publishers which was run by a poet. That's right, yeah, you, yeah, T.S. <laughs> Eliot. Yeah. Uh, so I always uh, uh, say that the poets are the real publishers. And uh, <laughs> no, but uh, tell us a word about, uh, about the, the situation yeah. now. Well, it's, it's linked actually with poetry and that is something that I really, respect, really respected about Faber and Faber, that it was independent. There was the legend of, we had a basket for the manuscripts that apparently T.S. Eliot had. His widow was around. Um, and American Faber didn't want to take on poetry, but Grey Wolf got the subsidy to do it, so it, it attracted me. And um, I said in, in, the, in the paper um, that the fact that we have poetry at the center of Grey Wolf sort of, I think, educates us to work that is more literary, that isn't, doesn't follow the market, that sort of leads the market, that's innovative thinkers, creative writers. And that is something that a lot of the smaller houses are doing. It's interesting, this, that film was made in the, at the 45th anniversary of Grey Wolf Press, and this year is Grey Wolf's 50th. And there's been a little change even in the last uh, five years because, um, the, these genres in, the, in America anyway, I'm not sure about here, of poetry and essays. It used to be if you really wanted to guarantee that nobody would buy a book, you would stick essays on the cover. And then the last 10 years or so, they really started to sell well. And some of that was publishing that Grey Wolf was doing. Um, and publishing books by diverse voices. And then the larger houses are like, what's going on? How come these writers are selling so well at Grey Wolf? And they 
as happens to many smaller houses, the larger house pick the author, and we're used to that, but then they started picking the genre. <laughs> then they started to publish more essays, and Sonny Mehta, a very well-known editor of Knopf, told me that some of his co colleagues would talk about Grey Wolf Envy, <laughs> and some other colleagues have told me that they took on books based on Grey Wolf sales figures, not the same authors. But I still think that um, the la like somebody I know started working for one of these larger houses and she sent me a screenshot of the sales figures of a Grey Wolf book to guide her publishing of a completely different book. And it, it was the, the book by Claudia Rankin book Citizen that sold so well. But Claudia Rankin's sales of Citizen didn't tell us anything about the next Claudia Rankin book. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to tell them much about the sales of their book. But you do see how the larger houses, they can be slow to react. <laughs> By the time you know, they've turned the ship around, the cultural moment that they're responding to is over or has changed. So there is a way where the smaller presses, and I think you can see that across the world when you go to the Frankfurt Book Fair. Yes, it's so a, interesting. A very concrete question. I am a writer living in a little village in Montana. Yes. Or Tennessee or whatever. <laughs> um, and uh, I have written a big book, wonderful <laughs> book, about my life in a little village in Montana or Tennessee. And uh, so I'm totally convinced that that is the super book about living in the country, etc. So now I'm finished. I have uh, written the last sentence and I'm going to find the publisher for that. Would I call you at uh, Gray, uh, uh, Gray Wolf? Uh, or would I go to uh, Knopf, or would I go to Simon & Schuster? Uh, it all belongs to, to German yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> publishing companies, um, I have to say. But um, uh, why is uh, this idea of uh, Grey Wolf and other, yeah. a lot of other wonderful yeah. small publishers, why is it so attractive nowadays, yeah. much more attractive than to, to put your book into a sea, into a, into yeah. a huge uh, water, and you never uh, well, know I think where it, it lands. It's a good question, and I think a lot of it is to do with context. And um, what, there is a, definitely a division between a big conglomerate and a small house. But I also think it's interesting to think about the lists that are, there's a coherent catalog, so that the, the list of books makes sense, that there's a literary sensibility behind all of them. So you see that Faber and Faber, you see that at, in Farris Strauss, um, you see that in Seagull, you see that um, in, 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 a, in a lot of how you see that at, at Grey Wolf. And so within a larger house, the, the, the really large conglomerates, inside that, there could be a little unit that is really doing literary books, maybe Hogarth or something. And so within, you have to find your pocket of a team that are devoted in a coherent way. Otherwise, what happens is if you have a quiet book, um, the publicist and your, and your publicist is working on a range of books, they have to give the biggest attention to the noisy book, you know, the the blockbuster pop star biography or the politician biography or what food to eat for your brain. And then there's a small little book about growing up in Montana. They're like, what? I'll, I'll get to that later. But if they're in a house and a context where it's, they're interested in really good writing, a poet, you know, poetic edge, lyrical, and they've had a success with something like that. And so the media is going to them. Have you got anything else? like that book about 
that was set in Tennessee, and they'll say, yeah, so here's this one in Montana. You know, so it's, I think it's the, those, those coherent units is what interests me. And yeah. One more question. So uh, I send it to you, and you write me a letter saying you are the new William Faulkner, uh, and I'm very happy uh, to see you very soon, and we're going to publish it. Uh, but uh, how many uh, of your books you published came directly by the mail, and how yes. many came from agents? agents. Yes. Um, we have a few um, open, like we had a, a non-fiction competition where we solicit a manuscript, but there's so much fiction coming in, and we were asking the interns to read it, and they were sending it all back. So we stopped doing that with fiction. So the fiction tends to come through agents or through, if it's translation through the international book fairs, but we would go to festivals and uh, writers' conferences where you meet with writers and if one of our authors has a student, so we would get people coming di direct, but um, if that person is in Montana um, wanting to be a writer, they would probably get themselves to some kind of summer publishing course or something where you meet other writers, other agents, and um, the the industry is, is, is crawling with agents. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of two or three degrees of separation and you can find yourself an agent who then might um, then find global. But the, the poets go direct. The poets go direct. And, and I say some of the nonfiction. So it is still very attractive to be a, a writer in America. I mean, if if a young man is going to his parents and says, what do you want to do? Uh, I'm, I want to be a poet. A father says, no. Uh, first, you have to learn something real. But uh, it seems that in America, it's yeah. an endless story of new names and new... Yeah. Uh, it must be a very attractive job to, to sit at home in yeah. Montana and writing novels about... Uh, well, there's... There's always grants and um, prizes and um, I don't know, I, I think I never recovered from children's stories where the gold is actually is in the bronze box, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so I just, I always love how you, 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 you get the winner by, if you're the writer you, out of the small, choosing the small press or if you're the publisher choosing the quiet um, genre and, and, and I don't know if you've, you have this, Naveen, and, and you have this, Michael, and if you have this mm -hmm. also, but one of my favorite things about publishing is that, just as, that that's my gesture for the long tail, the long arc. So um, publishing, it's, it, the, the headline story is about what happens one, you know, the day of publication. Are you reviewed? Is there attention? Are you having a launch? the day, the week, this maybe the six month period. And then it goes sort of quiet and then the publishing house is moved on to the next, the next book. But then things can happen two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. So some poets, for example, um, never go out of print. They're never the bestseller the year that they're published. So we, we published um, Vijay Sajri and um, Wild Kingdom in sort of like 1995 or 1996 or something. And by the end of that financial year, it ha had not broken a thousand copies. And then two books later, so two books later, he won the Pulitzer Prize. And that first book never ever went out of print. And so that's, that's one of the things I valued about being nonprofit is that you, it gave you the time. Because the, the, the world, um, we, we heard, heard this morning Kapke Kasabova talking about the in, impatience of the world, that publishing is this wonderful industry that's all about ideas and language and this kind of thing, but it can also be very stupid and start judging something three months after it's out the gate. And some works are not supposed to catch within three months. 
And we've had a great example recently of the writer Percival Everett, who we published many, many books over many, many years. And he got sort of a little, you know, cult following. And, um, and then he re in, in recent years, he got nominated for a Pulitzer, he got shortlisted for the Booker Prize. And now there's a film of one of, of a book that came out 20 years ago, Erasure, is now the film American Fiction. And that was the film that got the um, Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay. So there's Percival Everett at the Oscars 20 years after the book comes out. So when you young people are, uh, have arrived in publishing and someone is challenging you about a book, why isn't it selling? I think it's always good, it might not help you that week, but so you know, maybe the two of you, since, we, since we've all three been in publishing, and all four, I mean, weigh in with some of your long, if you agree with that idea about the long arc. Navin. You're speaking about 20 years. I mean, <laughs> we are still reading Dante. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Shakespeare. Exactly, exactly. Some of us. Yeah. Navin, do you want to ask something to Fiona? Yes, or? Oh, sit, sit in the corner. It's yes, not sit in the corner. <laughs> or to say you're not. Um, Talk about your I, I, you want to, I want to uh, inject a slight note of uh, discomfort discomfort with the times we are in oh. at the moment, and uh, discomfort with the fact that, at least personally, ever since October, when at the Frankfurt Book Fair, I have felt a sense of, uh, what shall I say, um, literature is beginning to sound hollow, personally. It was a time when I could turn to a book in Moments of Darkness, and find answers, which is why we got into the kind of work that we all do. So just a little bit to both of you about, it's been bothering me, the role of the publisher mm -hmm. in terms of contributing to the intellectual climate of that particular time seems to have been totally forgotten now. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody really focuses on it. And at the same time, with all due respect, there are these wonderful publishers here, including myself, who intuitively have contributed to the times. Michael certainly has, she certainly has. Um, you certainly have. And it's not just about what is worrying me, but today the focus has shifted to doing more and more and more books each year so that the balance sheets match. So it's just a comment, I'd like both of you to weigh in, and perhaps to be wherever there is. Yeah. You weigh in. Yes. Do you have anything to say, Jim? Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I'm such a uh, technical idiot that uh, uh, as long as there are 200 good books a year I can read, I'm satisfied. And there are always 200 good books, yeah. I have to say. 20 philosophy, 20 literature, 20 poets. Um, you can't read more than 200 books a year. And if you read some of the, the, some of the books of the older yeah. times, you have enough to do for your life. Yeah. So I don't, um, no, but I, I'm, I'm much more scared about the fact that uh, the aesthetical value of books, that is disappearing. The so which value? The, the aesthetic, oh. the, the, the aesthetic uh, um, discussion of books is uh, becoming a kind of, uh, yeah, it's, uh, this book is good or is bad or is nice or whatever. And uh, so I had, I have the impression that in, in but probably it's wrong. But in my youth, uh, when I started in uh, this business, uh, I was uh, much more discussing uh, uh, the values of books and not the content, for example. You know, mm -hmm. now you say this is a book on 
Love Between Turtles, and this is the book about that subject, and you have to read it if you are interested in turtles. Uh, but uh, nobody is asking if that is a good book or a bad book, or uh, yeah. what is it? What is style, and etc. Picture. So um, I'm a little bit scared uh, and now. Uh, after all these uh, th theoretical waves we had, right. the, the, the structuralists and the de deconstruction and the de, -de deconstruction, and now uh, after that is over, and you are sitting uh, in front of the pure text, uh, there is not m much left. Uh, in, in, in criticism of yeah. uh, what you are reading and why you should read yeah. it at all. Um, is, it, uh, is it just a habit? Is it, uh, why is it? Why, why do we read uh, yeah. until now all these novels and essays and uh, is it necessary yeah. for our uh, picture of the world, of our education, etc. So uh, it needs a lot of uh, thinking to yeah. be a publisher today. Yeah. Um, uh, or you say it's a business, and then you have to make some money, so you have to uh, yeah. you have to publish the memoirs of Berlusconi and so on. You know. <laughs> but I just always think there's always been an element of nonsense going on in publishing, whatever the current nonsense is, and I just just disregard it really, and that might be too passive um, in terms of you know chasing after an, em an empty book. And I, I remember before the internet at high school, it wasn't, you know, the majority of the class was not in love with books then in the 70s, but, um, and people were worried that television took away from reading, but people kept reading. And then, then there was the decade or so when anybody who met me it found out I was in publishing, asked me about um, whether or not ebooks was going to kill the book. And then I went round to universities and all, all the young people were buying the physical book. And it was 60 year old women who were buying the Kindle because either their bookshelf was full or they wanted to put their suitcase. So books persist, even hardcover books persist. And in the States, you've got someone like Paul Segal, absolutely brilliant critic, still writing. And I don't expect there to be 500 Paul Segals per generation. And it, there's definitely, you know, it's like I was saying before, that um, before maybe it was three or four brilliant critics that you went to. Now it's proliferating and it's a TikTok opinion or a, twi a tweet opinion or a, you know, and you, you, you have to navigate it, but the New Yorker is still going. There are still places. So it's not, it's not easy, but I, I feel like I've never expected it to be easy. Now, to, to Naveen's more sort of like somber point, I remember um, when the Iraq war came out, it's like, we had an Iraqi poet and I, on the list, and I felt very pleased about that. But then, back when we thought the worst thing that could happen was George Bush the mm second -hmm. getting in again, I was like, well, you know, what else can we do? And I, I felt a little, I didn't have an answer. And um, as somebody older, looking with the younger generation during the pandemic, and uh, you all heard about um, George Floyd and that happened in our city. Um, and I, I didn't have answers for the, the young people. And, um, and then um, the environmental disasters that are coming. So I think perhaps, you know, there's ways our, our generation and the generation before us haven't done a great job. And maybe not everybody wants to read what we have to say or our people have to say. On the, at the same time, I, I still do th think that um, it, it is from writers that we're going to get a lot of answers. I mean, um, I don't know if anybody else here heard Katka Kasabova speaking this morning about this place in the Balkans. And 
she's talking about in the book about an empty town where in fact there's two people living still. And those two people give her hope that it's not an empty town. And she was very articulate about the way these people are living on the land as their ancestors did and how they're finding herbs and the herbs are medicinal. And there was just, I just got that little glimmer of hope. Like here's something not theoretical, not let's all do this, but here's a granular example of, of people sort of resisting all the things that we're moaning about, capitalization, globalization, the, the, the speed of, uh, the speeding up of culture. And it is the poets that we turn to. It is the poets, e even, as, even, even as some poets write prose, <laughs> call it prose, that can think, can think towards a different future. So um, I think it's important to, um, to be somber and to acknowledge the moments, and I'm glad you brought that in, but I also think it's important to uh, f move towards the places where we can be hopeful and um, have that as a criterion. That's, that's one of the things in terms of um, Grey Wolf having a diverse list. It wasn't, it wasn't to tick boxes. It was because if I read a poem and somebody's got an image about wolves gambling and, and I know they never even saw a wolf, <laughs> I'm like, it's just not real. You know, I, I want... I want to read about the world that I can see that's got lots of different people in it, that's got problems in it, that's got, I don't, I don't need the world to be um, sort of literally and metaphorically whitewashed for me. I want to read the writers who are finding things difficult, why are they finding it difficult and show it, offering ways, ways out, I think. If you have two questions uh, which may interest all the people who want to to work in publishing houses. We understand that uh, be a publisher. Sorry? A publisher is a very difficult job. Dif yes. It's a difficult job because it's not always the same. In, the, in play different places, it's a different job. Yes. It's not like being a physician or or a cook, I mean, uh, it's very difficult. If you are a publisher in a small, tiny little, or a big, huge company, it's very difficult, it's very different. And it's different probably in Italy, than Germany, in, Ger in Spain, in, in India. So it's, you, you should explain what are the qualities indispensable qualities to be a publisher for you in America now. What did you say, John? Fame, fame. <laughs> it's, it, is, it is a very good question. And um, in your question, you're actually answering the fact that there isn't an answer. <laughs> because if it was a sentence, we would all know it. But uh, it's, a, it's a lovely question, and um, that is one of the things that is, makes us love it, is it, because it's always fresh, it feels very fresh. Um, it's a, always a different book, a different time, a, a different story that you're trying to push forwards. And um, there's many different roles within the publishing house, and... Um, I've been with people who, in the, on the marketing side who, um, if they saw six bookstores and two of them had events at their store, they would be like, okay, I'll, I'll deal with the events if I have to, but really what I want is to sell books to each of those six stores. And then another person who would be like, well, I'll sell if I have to, but I'm really interested in the two that have events because I really love events. So as the the literal publisher is the person who's running it. It's maybe a question of finding out the skills of the people, you know, putting them in the right place. And um, 
attending to the whole, um, the 360 degrees of it. I, I think um, for me, one of the values that I um, hold foremost, and when I haven't displayed it, I have felt the most shame is, first of all, being open. Like if I, if I saw a manuscript and didn't, if I understood it and thought, well, I'm not the best publisher for this. So but curiosity, if I, yes, but interest of the yes, the curiosity. So if I look at something and, you know, or it reminds me of something in the in the wrong way, like I make an assumption, that's and I and I turned it down and it does well somewhere else. Then I then I felt bad. So I, I think a curiosity, um, reading other uh, reading a lot of other things. Um, for for me, when I you know, I've actually retired um, from the Grey Wolf job now, but um, when I look back, I, I, I thought maybe if I retired and I look back, I would, I would wonder what was I doing all those years. It was 28 years at Grey Wolf and 40 years in publishing altogether. But it's, it's the opposite. I think, oh, I just loved it. It was just the right thing for me. And what I loved about it is, on the one hand, it's very... Um, immediate and palpable you make a book and you and you get the physical product in your hand and you print 10,000 and then you reprint another 2,000 and you've sold 12,000 or you print 10,000 and you 10,000 go into the stores and 5,000 come back and you're with 5,000 it's you can always point numerically to something that you've done but in addition like in fact um, Luca mentioned this word alchemy so there's a kind of, mm, there's this other thing that you're doing about the cultural impact, the, the love that you're sharing. There's a, these other things that can't be measured and that can be really beautiful that you're also doing. So it's the, I love the practical and the metaphorical thing that you're doing. Can you just say one word um, about the selling of the books? Yeah. Is I, it via yeah. the bookshops or yeah. is it a percentage? Uh, what is going on via bookshops and what yes. is going via in internet? Or, uh, yeah. How do you sell the, the, the books you publish? Um, you know, d different ways and, um, um, you know, sometimes it goes through the, the sales reps. And Francesca this morning was talking about having sales conference where the editor starts, you know, to the, um, the, the rep and then the rep goes out to multiple bookstores and um, so you're always trying to sort of amplify out, aren't you? That's one model that one editor talks to one rep, talks to m different, um, you know, maybe 100 bookstores, and then 100 bookstores maybe have 100,000 customers that they then speak to. Then, then there's the kind of you, the publicity machine that goes behind a book where you get the, the author on the radio, in the paper, that kind of thing. Then you have to go, nowadays, you have to go to the influencers, the people who are going to write about the book online. And then there's, um, there can be um, direct sales, which we, at our house, we didn't do very much. We tried to direct people who came to our website to the bookstore, because we didn't want to compete with the bookstore. And that selling, it's more sort of, it's one-on-one. -on -one. It makes you, it's direct, but it's, it's very cumbersome for a smaller house, but then there are other houses that maybe have like a um, subscription model. Uh, do you have that, a subscription? Yeah. But we do direct sales. Direct sales, yeah. And you have to really, ha there are certain things like that if you're going to do direct sales and you, you have to sort of really do them and have somebody who does it. Um, do, does you have someone who's dedicated to that? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So then it makes sense, but if you're borrowing from another job to do direct sales, it's actually, you know, for, for us, we, just, we, did, we made that equation that it wasn't worth it. And then, you know, we were talking, I think it was yesterday, about um, the, the, the internet. And I remember there was a moment when I realized that people on the internet <laughs> weren't necessarily living 100%. <laughs> they weren't e-people. <laughs> they were physical people. And so you can reach someone on the internet directly through Twitter or whatever, and they will physically go to a bookstore and buy a book. I thought it would be one or the other, that if you were, if you were reaching someone on the internet, they would buy an e-book. 
And if you, if you re reach somebody in the physical world, so by a physical book, but it's ch jumping around. The same people. Yeah, yes, the same people. They're the same. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, we are the people, yes, yes. yes. So, and, the, and some of the another public, yeah. Some of the ebook, so, so a couple of ebook company companies started, and they and they were only doing ebooks, and they didn't make it because they needed to have the books in the bookstores, which is fascinating. And I mean, the COVID has changed a lot, I think, because you know there was a lot of buying online and so on, and people were going to bookstores less. So I think. We've been, John, my, my husband and I have been talking about, we haven't sort of fully bounced back. Who is reading less after COVID than before COVID in the room? Just like, like during COVID, who read a lot of books in the room? And if you put your hand up, do you read less now? Put your hand up if you read less now. So you're reading a few. That's encouraging. So some of you, just, it, it kept, kept with you kept up the habit, yeah. Because I think some people, some publishers across the world have seen sales went up a lot during COVID and then came back down again. So, but I, I do think, uh, and that's why in, sometimes I don't, I don't like to be like, only good hap things happen in the small houses and only bad things happen in the large houses. Because some small houses, I think, disrespect that sales, which is, we, we always used to say that's our mission. We're not, it's, we're not fully a publisher until we've found the person, you know. And if you can, yeah, I, I always, I enjoy that. I enjoy the selling of the fact that we sell. And I like the event. <coughs> so I, th I, think, I think being good, at, being good at all of it is part of the answer. Not just thinking it's just editing or just design or just sales. But being able to bring it all together, I think, is the, so. It's the a job to, with full of small jobs inside. Yes, and bring it all together, and it's hard, but it kind of should be hard because a literary book is often one that n not not a single person in the world has asked the author to write. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, they, it's coming out of their head. They're not responding to anything, mm -hmm. so it's brand new. So there's a way where the fact that 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 the books are reviewed or then amazingly bought by another country and published again. It's, un it's, an it's incredible to me that not just that long arc in time, but in, in space. And, and it's not difficult in ways that are unpleasant, I don't think. It's difficult in ways that keeps you on your toes, you know? But it's not, it's not grindingly difficult, I don't Do you agree? I think it's pleasurably difficult. Does that mean, do you think or not? Yeah. <laughs> Some days it can be a grind. So a publisher is not a businessman? If he's not an artist? I think he's both. I think both. He is both. That's what exactly, I think. Exactly what I think. You he's think. both. Yes. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to be both. No. We can do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if you are... The man in Mon the lady in Montana. Yeah. And you write you, a poem. You, uh, and, and you write a poem. <laughs> you, write. You, you wouldn't give it uh, to a philosopher to publish it. You no. better find somebody who's interested in selling the book. Of course. Okay. With, with business, when some people tell me that they're, they're not very good with numbers or something, I would say, come on. You just, like, six, four. Which is the bigger number? If you know the answer, you know, I think it's, I think people can get precious around it, but it's, it's not, it's not so hard, I don't think. It, it's not. Um, but it's a work of, it's a job of experience too. It, yes. And nobody can yes. tell you if you have to. To, to print 10,000 no. copies or, or 3,000. Yeah. It's a word of experience. And you did, did you have a... You're very often you are wrong. Yes. Did, did, you, did you have a game when you were a it's child? It's a job of mistakes. Is it is a job of mistakes. What's that thing they, they talk about? They talk about divorce and remarriage. It's what's hope over experience. Mm. <laughs> did, 
Did you ever have a, 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 a childhood game where you have to pin the tail on the donkey? Do you have that one? You're blindfolded and you have mm -hmm. a picture of a donkey that no tail and so the kids go up blindfolded and stick the tail on. And when we would have a print run committee and I would call it the tail of the donkey because you know, you know within a range but you don't ever know. But it's, it's more fun to underprint than overprint. But it can be, you know, if you've put your, if you've worked, um, put your heart and soul into a book and you've had, you know, a great business idea, you know, you, or it's all worked and then you put it out and then it doesn't sell. That can be soul destroying or that upsetting. But that's, I think that's a difficult, different kind of difficulty from the pragmatically working out what to do next. Last question. There's a lot of girls who want to, to work in publisher house, publishing house. And now there are a lot of girls everywhere in the world who are publisher or want to be publisher. Something very different from 50 years ago. Do you, f do you find a reason, do you explanation of that? Well, I, I think we're very good at it. <laughs> I would have a little word of advice which is if you're thinking of going into publishing, to think not only of the editorial position, but <clears throat> rights and sales. And even if you think you want to be an editorial, it can be a nice way to start to work in a bookstore, something like that. You worked in a bookstore, you were telling me. <clears throat> and it's an experience that you can, <clears throat> I always wish I had done that, that you can take with you and a friend of mine once said, you don't want to start <clears throat> where you want to end up because you can't, you can't move, you can't leave, but to sort of just start anywhere, get anything, get some experience in turn, and then take that with you forward. Last question, Naveen. Oh, um, I actually think that America's major contribution to the world of publishing is the word front list, uh, which, which I've always found both entertaining and frustrating because I am the opposite of the front list. I believe in reinventing, pretty much like the magician. Uh, you know, you don't want a backlist of a dead archive. So, I feel that one has spent a lifetime reinventing. In the old days, it used to be hardback, becomes a paperback, yeah. becomes an e-book. Yeah. Now we reinvent them as graphic novels. We reinvent the same author who has disappeared into an audio book. So is that, you know, versus Jane Fonda animal rights, which sells 150,000 copies, but you don't take your grandchildren to that particular book. So this value of the backlist. Yeah. And now, as we were talking yesterday, the backlist is under threat, particularly, you know, in the European context where certain kinds of authors have fallen out of favor, the younger people aren't reading them, and a certain political correctness yeah. is canceling a lot of very wonderful literature. So just a comment, really. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Everybody know what front list and back list mean? <clears throat> it is an incredible thing. It's what that what I was talking about, that long arc happens because say it's a theater and you have a play on, it can't sell more tickets than the number of, you know, full seats times the number of nights. But if you have a book that sells, it can just keep on selling for many years. But I think it's, I think all, all life is change and cycles. So <clears throat> it's going to come and go and I think some of, the, some of the books that are disappearing now will come back. You know, there's, there's going to be there's always little course corrections and rediscoveries of somebody. So even if it migrates to a different list or something. So um, I think it's en endlessly fascinating all the, the ways of change. And I, I think what you're doing and what you just described is, is brilliant publishing. Well... I think Fabio tells us the hour. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks for your lovely mm -hmm. questions, everybody. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you.